things are changing, as many of you know better than I do. Judith has seen a lot of change. Much of the change we're seeing is for the worse. We're seeing the rise of a new Jim Crow in this country, where more African Americans are in prison now than were enslaved in 1850. Um, we're seeing a rise of an inequality that's building a new Gilded Age in this country, an inequality that seems permanent and is subsuming our political system to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if the Supreme Court authorized new law that would allow Charles and David Koch and Sheldon Adelson and Paul Singer to literally force feed politicians money in Guantanamo style chairs. <laughs> We're seeing this system of inequality and mass imprisonment and a war on immigrants, 400,000 deported each year by the Obama administration, prisoners being force fed at the ICE Center in Tacoma. We're seeing it proceed with uh, bipartisan support. Um, we're hearing a lot about polarization in this country. There is polarization. The Republicans in Congress are obstructionists. They are enacting a system of voter suppression. But the real issue here, as Adolph Reed pointed out in Harper's in his must-read essay, is consensus. The problem is consensus in Congress. The problem is consensus among our elites, our societal elites, our university presidents, um, the people who control our institutions, which have been hollowed out of any principle, um, deliberately hollowed out. And the one issue where there is the most consensus is the one that's bringing us here today. It's why we're here. We're here because of the consensus among the 1% on the issue of Israel-Palestine, because Israel is a strategic asset for the global 1%. But for the rest of us, it's corroding our society. Our special relationship with Israel is damaging, deeply damaging Judaism, and it's imprisoning Palestinians and importing Islamophobia into our society. One of the things Adolf Reed complains about is the lack of uh, ideas in either party. There's an obstruction uh, and a, um, there's a um, kind of an institutional fear of exploring new ideas or new solutions. There are no new horizons. And what I see, having been around the country since October and talking about my book, um, Goliath, um, and I've been everywhere, I've been on tour almost constantly is that horizons are expanding around this issue. They're especially expanding on campus, thanks to Students for Justice in Palestine. And they're directly targeting the issue of Palestine, the issue of Israeli apartheid, occupation, and militarism. But they're also doing something more, which is challenging the military-industrial complex in general and pushing societal, societal elites on what kind of speech they'll permit. And I have in my hands a victory. I haven't heard about a lot of victories recently. But this is a victory yesterday provided to me by Randy. And it is a victory against the Israeli government by citizens from Olympia, Washington. It's a, it's a victory in the name, in, the, in, in honor of Rachel Corey and in honor of Craig and Cindy Corey and all the work they've done. Um, it's part of their legacy, only a small part of a legacy that has yet to be completely fulfilled. But it is a victory worth cheering because it highlights where this movement and this cause is going. The Israeli government through Stand With Us, which many of you know and don't love, Understandably, I, I mean, they're, they're kind of like herpes. They just won't go away. Um, Stand With Us is a 501c3 nonprofit, another uh, pro-Israel organization projecting Islamophobia and racism into this country, which sought through very anti-democratic 
means to obstruct a vote at the Olympia Co-op conducted democratically to express through protected speech opposition to Israeli apartheid and to declare a boycott of goods produced by companies directly involved in the occupation, directly involved in apartheid. Um, the Israeli government's Deputy Foreign Minister Denny Ayalon declared in 2011 that we are using Stand With Us as leverage inside the United States. Akiva Tor, the Israeli Gen Consul General, uh, was present at demonstrations against the Olympia Co-op. And it was clear the Israeli finger government's fingerprints were there on everything done to stop this democratic vote from being fulfilled. And thanks to some progressive anti-SLAP legislation, SLAP stands for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. The Israeli government is trying to stop American citizens from pub participating in public policy through these kind of lawsuits. Thanks to anti-SLAP legislation and thanks to some very reasonable judges, this SLAP suit has been nullified and the boycott will go through. Now, many of you have been doing this work for a long time, but I feel like we're just getting started here. I feel like there was, there was a, a January with Soda Stream and Charlotte, Scarlett Johansson was a pivotal moment. Um, everyone's talking about BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction. It's really like the only game in town right now. Thomas Friedman completely mischaracterized it, but was forced to discuss it and forced to engage with it. Benjamin Netanyahu, in his um, latest fear-mongering speech at AIPAC, mentioned BDS 18 times. I remember two years ago when Dershowitz came out to Philadelphia for the first annual BDS conference that I participated in, and he was calling it DBS. So now they're getting the name right. They're starting to understand at least what the name is. They don't understand what it means. And what we are going to see in the coming months is an incredible, incredible intensification. Um, yesterday, John Kerry, Secretary of State John Kerry, testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and placed the blame squarely on the Israeli government of Benjamin Netanyahu for refusing to release the fourth tranche of Palestinian prisoners and authorizing 700 tenders for settlement units in East Jerusalem for the collapse of the framework agreement, or what Kerry has called the framework for a framework. <laughs> Unlike in 2000, when Ehud Barak and President Bill Clinton blamed Arafat for walking away from a terrible deal crafted by Dennis Ross and the Israeli government. So things are changing. And a recent poll conducted by Shibli Telhami, who is probably the only Arab American I can think of who ever served on a negotiating team, who is now a fellow at the Brookings Institute, Telhami commissioned a poll through the polling firm GFK. And he asked Americans, 1,000 thousand Americans across political lines, age, across ages, demographic groups, what solution would you favor if the two-state solution collapses? John McCain said to John Kerry today, the talks between Israel and Palestinians are over. Face it. Accept reality. He said that to John Kerry's face. So what do, what do most Americans favor? What kind of solution? According to the GFK poll, 64% of Americans prefer a single democratic state to a Jewish state. Only 20% of Americans, if, two state if the two-state solution is deemed to be a failure, favor a Jewish state. And we have Caroline Glick going around the country right now, former advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu, um, a former embedded reporter in Iraq who is the only reporter to have found WMD. <laughs> and she wasn't embedded, she was like her own unit. Um, and someone who is you know, close to these groups like Stand With Us, injecting far-right Islamophobic propaganda into this country. And Glick is arguing for the Jewish state, being hosted by far-right organizations. She's arguing for the current reality, simply consolidating the current reality. What is the current reality? The current reality is described in my book. How do I approach the situation? I approach the situation on the ground in my book as a single state with everyone from the river to the sea living under Israeli control. 
under a regime of separation where rights are apportioned according to ethnicity and religion, to the circumstances of your birth. Therefore, Jews enjoy superior rights simply because of their J-positive blood. I, I, I would gain that. And Palestinians either have no rights or exist on some sophisticated Israeli matrix of bureaucratic and administrative control as citizens of Israel or are among the five to seven million Palestinian refugees who are excluded from Israel because of the demographic threat they present to Israel's ethnic purity. And ethnic purity really is the essence of the maintenance of a Jewish state. All contaminants to, an, to the, the Jewish state must be either excluded or permanently controlled with their growth, growth of their population limited. Uh, two days ago, J Street hosted a seminar in Seattle. Um, the, it was a, a physician um, who is a pro-Israel activist in Seattle. His name is Wolf. Uh, was um, tasked by J Street to give this workshop under their million dollar um, two-state education program. They're going around you know, rallying for two states while John McCain is saying that there is no talks between Israel and Palestine currently except reality, while John Kerry is blaming the Israeli government for a complete collapse of one of his signature initiatives. And this Dr. Wolf said that he stays up late at night, um, can't sleep, because of the growth of Palestinians. Um, he's, Palestinian babies give him nightmares. Uh, I like babies. Babies are cute. Babies are fun to play with. But Palestinian babies are scary because they're not Jewish. And if they multiply, then soon Israel either has to do one of two things, create a quasi-state for them and do away with them as South Africa tried to do, the apartheid government of South Africa, with the black African population by creating Bantu stands, which were completely controlled from the outside with no sovereignty and false puppet leadership, quizzling leadership like Mahmoud Abbas, or expel them or permanently dominate them. And so on the one hand, you have J Street arguing that they should be given the quasi-state of Bantu stands because of the fear of a brown people. Ultimately, this stems from the fear of a brown planet. So a lot of these people don't want them in their neighborhoods either. Then, on the other hand, you have Caroline Glick arguing for complete control from the river to the sea, um, total domination, Give those Palestinians in Area A, which are the Bantu stands, the four main population centers, give them Jordanian residency, do away with them as Palestinians. Of course, these um, right-wing Zionists don't believe that Palestinians exist in the first place. And then the Palestinians in Area C, the 60% of the West Bank given to the Israelis under the Oslo Accords, the failed Oslo Accords, will be forced to take loyalty oaths, loyalty oaths to the Jewish state and um, failing that, they can just simply pack their bags and go, pack their bundles and leave, in the words of Avigdor Lieberman. Um, so Israel's, so the Glick plan is to annex 60% of the West Bank, do away with the Palestinian state, give Jordanian residency to everyone in Area A. That also happens to be the plan of the economics minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, and most of the young members of the Likud party who are pressuring the current Prime Minister Netanyahu from the right. Then you have the J Street plan. Basically, give them a Bantustan state. And J Street has gotten behind the Kerry plan. I want to be just, you know, really hammer on this point about what a two-state solution will mean for Palestinians under the Kerry framework, under the U.S. plan. Kerry has said that the Palestinian Authority, if they accept this plan, which J Street is lobbying for in the US, will have to give Israel drone overflight rights. They'll have to have a new wall on the Jordanian border that will imprison them between two walls, the separation wall on the Jordanian border. They will not have any rights to their aquifer because they will have to recognize the 80% of settlements which are in the major settlement blocks and the Palestinian aquifer lays beneath Ariel, which is the major settlement unit. 
and they will have to allow Israeli troops to be in the Jordan Valley, the only arable land in the West Bank, for anywhere between 10 and 50 years. Finally, they will have to accept Israel as a Jewish state, as a Jewish exclusivist state, which would be the same as asking me and Judith to accept the US as a white Christian nation, something that we are you know, not really going to do because we believe in democracy. This would doom the 20% of Israel who are Palestinians to a permanent regime of discrimination and apartheid, and it would permanently exclude the five to seven million refugees who have legitimate claims. And the Gaza Strip is not even discussed in this agreement. It will be indefinitely a warehouse for surplus humanity, a human warehouse that will be besieged and controlled from the outside. And the West Bank, as I described, will be Gazified. It will become a panopticon with early warning systems, in the words of Kerry, which are actually um, spying systems that will now surround Palestinian cities. So these are the two options that are on the table. This is the reality. You know, when people tell you, get real, you can't be for equal rights, you're an extremist, get real. Well, then these are the two options. And I'm here to tell you that there's a third option, which is simply equality, something that has been tried in Northern Ireland and South Africa. And while this result is imperfect, people are uh, not exactly at war. It hasn't resulted in a nightmare. And it seems to be one way out. The status quo that the US has sustained has made all of the trends that I describe in my book possible. Um, it's why the situation is the way I describe it. And what I found when I immersed myself in Israeli society, starting in 2009 when Israel elected its most right wing government, the most right wing government in its history. Um, was a society, in the words of many of my Israeli friends, veering towards fascism. Um, the deputy editor of Haaretz um, declared that she was as afraid, in, in 2012, I'm as afraid to live in Israel in 2012 as I would be to be a Jew in 1930s Germany or an African American in 1950s Alabama. Um, Isaac Herzog, who was the labor minister at the time, said Israel increasingly resembles 1950s Alabama. And he said, Shimon Peres, the president, should say something about the racism consuming our society. He never did. Um, but this is what's happening. This is what the pro-Israel forces, like Stand With Us, with their slap suits and their harassment on campus and their anti-BDS laws are trying to obscure. They're trying to prevent the free flow of information. They're prevent trying to prevent us from talking about the real Israel that most Americans don't know. Um, when I entered Israel, I immediately, immediately immersed myself in the Knesset, which is, you know, the parliament of Israel. And I found that when I talked to Palestinian legislators, the few Palestinian legislators who are actively campaigning for the rights of the Palestinian minority inside Israel, that they felt that they could be, their presence would be illegalized at any point. Hanin Zuabi, the most hated woman in Israel, um, who is a Christian legislator from Nazareth, who traveled on the Free Gaza Flotilla, the Mavi Marmara, where nine activists were slaughtered by Israeli commandos, told me that our, it, our problem isn't that we hate Zionism. Our problem is that Zionism hates democracy. And she understands that because she has been banned from the Knesset twice in 2009 and in 2012 by the Central Elections Commission. Each time, the Supreme Court of Israel overturned her banning by a very narrow vote. And why was she banned? She's banned because she's a member of a party called Balad, headed by Azmi Bashara, a Palestinian Israeli intellectual who's been permanently exiled from Israel, accused of spying for Hezbollah as if this sophisticated paragovernmental guerrilla organization needs a portly intellectual to spy on Israel and do targeting for it. <laughs> and Balad believes and openly campaigns for Israel as a state of all its citizens. This is very dangerous in Israel. Balad's platform calls for Israel to be transformed into a society with no racial, ethnic, or religious preferences. 
um, with equal rights for all. Therefore, it was declared in a letter by Yuval Diskin in 2007, who was then the head of the Shin Bet, to be a threat to the Jewish state. He said that any threats to the Jewish or democratic state, that, that or is very significant. Um, he doesn't say and, he says or, uh, will be dealt with appropriately, meaning we will monitor you, we will surveil you, and we will eventually um, declare you to be a criminal element. So Balad is, def is definitely on the line. Jamal Zahalka, who replaced Bishara in the Knesset, told me that the week, a week hasn't gone by without an anti-democratic or racist law introduced in the Knesset. And I had a bet with a friend of mine that if one of these laws, the week went by without one of these laws introduced, uh, I would hold, hold the party and I'll buy the lamb. And he said, you know, a year has gone by and I haven't bought the lamb. These are laws, like the law passed recently, raising the electoral threshold to four votes. That sounds very benign, anodyne, almost boring. But the Arab parties in the Knesset hold less than four votes. It was targeting them specifically and indirectly the ultra-Orthodox parties, who are the bad Jews, because they're not interested in participating in military service to dominate and occupy an indigenous people. The Arab parties are now going to have a difficult time being elected because they rarely cross the four-seat threshold. Um, the acceptance to community law was passed in 2011, allowing communities of 500 or under to officially discriminate on the basis of race and religion. Um, and even, you know, gender or sexuality, if you look at what small kibbutzim do to deny single people and homosexuals the right to live there. There's some dying bug over there. I don't know if the Mossad put it there, but it's driving me insane. <laughs> Filed a slap suit against it. Um, so I'm talking about all these laws. There is one law in particular that many of you will be familiar with, especially if you help campaign with the Olympia Co-op. And it, was, it, it is a law that is far more repressive. Um, you know, I learned about this law first before it was introduced. When I was called by my friend Yonatan Shapira, um, I was at home, just south of Tel Aviv in Jaffa, and Yonatan called me and said, uh, I just came back from Warsaw, and the Shin Bet wants to interrogate me. The Shin Bet is Israel's general security service. Now, first of all, who is Yonatan Shapira? Yonatan Shapira is a former Israeli combat pilot who flew a Black Hawk helicopter that conducted rescue missions, and he organized a pilot's letter during the Second Intifada with pilots, the cream of the Israeli society, the golden sons of Israel, declaring that they would refuse to fly missions over the occupied territories. They would refuse to carpet bomb refugee camps. These are former and active combat pilots. And this shook Israeli society to its core. It shook Israel's institutions because the most respected institution in Israel is the army, the military, and above that is the Air Force, where the Ashkenazi elite, the sons of the kibbutz, go to fight the most educated figures, who are supposed to be the most moral, but have pr proven to be far less than that. And Yonatan thought that this had brought a change to Israel, but he watched the brutal repression of the Second Intifada continue, uh, of the uprising in the territories. He watched it continue in, through the end of the Intifada. Um, he watched the Gaza Strip placed under siege. And then Roger Waters came to Israel to give a peace concert at Nev Shalom, which is an intentional village that is home to Jews and Arabs, 50% Jews, 50% Arabs, um, a place that faces you know, some level of repression, um, administrative repression from the government. And his friends from the Air Force, his Air Force buddies, went to this concert and sang anti-establishment anthems. They, they sang for removing bricks from the wall. They sang against war. And he said the next day they went out and bombed the Gaza Strip in Operation Summer Rain, when the only electrical plant in the Gaza Strip was deliberately targeted and destroyed, when mo morgues were filled far beyond capacity and bodies were had, had to be taken to schools. 
and he realized that there was no possibility to make change from within. And so, along with many other Israelis, he turned to groups like Anarchists Against the Wall. Um, this is a group that I think is the most effective group in Israeli society in challenging the occupation. Maybe the only group that's been effective in challenging the occupation, comprised of activists, young people who literally level their bodies against the occupation. Yonatan said, you know, I've been trying to change Israel from within, now it's time for me to join the Palestinian struggle. That's the way these Jewish Israeli activists understand what they're doing. They're joining the Palestinian struggle and asking the Palestinians who have been their neighbors, what can we do to help you? And when they're asked what to do, they say, well, that sounds like something I can do. Let's go. They're not dictating to them. And they have almost no ideology. Uri Gordon, who is an anarchist, intellectual, and professor at Ben-Gurion University, um, I, I, um, who I quoted in my book, said that we didn't choose anarchists against the wall because we're an anarchist necessarily. We just chose it for its trans transgressive potential um, to get people to notice us. I mean, we could have called it Satanist against the wall. <laughs> so I think if there's any opportunity to host members of this group, you guys should do it. Um, so Yonatan went to Warsaw, which is the site of Jewish extermination. He went to the Warsaw Ghetto, where a single wall remains from the uprising, the uprising of Jews who took up arms against their occupier, who took up arms against their oppressor, and died fighting, but won a Pyrrhic moral victory. And Yonatan, with spray paint, wrote on that wall, as the grandson of Holocaust victims and survivors, end all ghettos, free Gaza, free Palestine. And he draped a little Palestinian flag on that wall. And so when he returned to Israel, he was immediately, uh, immediately received a call from the Shin Bet, just as Chinese dissidents do from Chinese internal security when they get invited out for tea. And he had to go. He had to go meet with Rona, who is a young woman who interviews or interrogates all of the activists with anarchists against the wall and the other groups combating occupation who are deemed effective. And so he called me because he wanted a journalist to be present. But I'm not an Israeli citizen, so I had some questions and I called up a lawyer friend who defends the children in the children's court in the Israeli military prison in the West Bank called Ofer. And he said, you do not want to deal, be present with the Shin Bet. You'll be blacklisted, and you'll be banned for 10 years. Do not go. You don't want to dance with the devil. And I said, well, uh, there, there's no pale moonlight, so, but <laughs> <laughs> I still probably shouldn't do that. Um, so I wound up walking um, a, a dog that Yonatan was dog sitting while he went into a police station and met with Rona. And he came out and he told me what happened. Um, and I couldn't report on it either, by the way. I had to miss this scoop, um, which was very disappointing as a journalist. He said that Rona told him that we will pass, introduce a law in the future criminalizing what you have done. Um, I, and she said, I don't understand why you did what you did. You must be insane. Um, but we will criminalize you. It was almost a scene out of a Philip K. Dick novel about future crime units or a Kafkaesque play um, about a young man subjected to a tribunal. And it occurred to me that this law must be in the offing. And sooner, soon enough, I was in the office of Zev Elkin, who is a rising star in the Likud party, um, someone from Moscow, an immigrant from Moscow, who is as connected to the land of Palestine as the San Francisco-based Credence Clearwater Revival is to the bayou, <laughs> whose Hebrew is pretty, seems to be pretty good, not as good as Hanin Zawabi's or other Palestinian legislators who have lived in the land of Palestine since, whose families have been there since before Zionist settlement, but who favors annexing 60% of the West Bank, who favors mass transfer of Palestinian citizens of Israel, 
um, stripping them of their citizenship rights, and who had just introduced a bill in the Knesset to criminalize Israeli citizens calling for a boycott of Israel or of settlement products. And under this bill, Israel was defined as anywhere between the river and the sea. Now, whenever anyone accuses me of wanting to wipe Israel off the map, I, I hand them a piece of paper and a pen, and I say, can you draw it for me, please? Because Israel has yet to define where it is. I think that map should say, where is Israel? Because at least we knew where some of the Palestine stuff was. Um, Israel is defined as Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. And anywhere there, any call to boycott any settlement could have been punished under this bill with one year in prison. Of course, the bill was watered down. They always shoot high and knowing the bill will be watered down. And it passed in diluted form. So now, any settler can sue any Israeli citizen without evidence if they believe that that citizen has harmed their business. It is the ultimate chilling of speech. Um, and it is this kind of method is being projected outwards peripatetically ag throughout the world against the global BDS movement. Uh, the Independent recently reported that Netanyahu planned to hire spies to infiltrate BDS networks. A uh, influential Israeli think tank, the Reut Institute, which is connected to the Israeli government, has called uh, for the infiltration of what it calls hubs of delegitimization. Um, and um, personal attacks and smears on BDS organizers. It's called for a price tag to be applied to those who campaign for equal Palestinian rights. So we can't look at these laws in a vacuum. Now, how do these laws apply to Palestinians? I've talked about how they're applying to um, Jewish Israelis, that they're making, that the lives of Jewish Israelis who are dissidents, even liberal Jewish Israelis, prominent figures, their, their freedoms are increasingly being limited under Netanyahu's Israel. But for Palestinian citizens, they are facing uh, the slogan of Avigdor Lieberman, no loyalty, no citizenship. And for them, if they fail to declare loyalty to Zionism, their citizenship rights will be swiftly limited in hopes that they will simply leave. Avigdor Lieberman this week has promised that there will be a Russian-speaking Israeli prime minister within the coming years. And he has been engaged in a rebranding process as Israel's foreign minister um, to succeed Netanyahu. Haaretz recently, the liberal voice, the voice of liberal Israel, recently published an article about Lieberman asking, um, is he the last hope for peace? A guy who has called for bombing the Aswan Dam in Egypt and drowning Palestinian prisoners in the Dead Sea. The New York Times has also given him favorable coverage. Uh, and Lieberman and his party, Yisrael Betenu, was behind another law called the Nakba law. What is the Nakba? You all know what the Nakba is. It was the ethnic cleansing and expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians during 1947 and 1948. Most of, these, most of their villages, or many of their villages, were destroyed before May 15th, 1948, the date of Israel's so-called independence. Um, one of these massacres that you may have heard of was Der Yassin, carried out by the Stern Gang after the Palmach regulars left the scene, and over 200 Palestinian women and children were slaughtered. Der Yassin today is a series of graves and rubble, not recognized, of course, as a memorial site by the Israeli government. And on top of it, the government has built a mental institution. Palestinians look at that and shudder. This week, right-wing vandals from the West Bank went to the site of Der Yassin and spray-painted death to Arabs on the graves of the victims of this massacre, attempting to kill them twice. And that's the spirit of the Nakba law. Under this law, the observance of the Nakba is criminalized, the mere observance. Because on May 15th, when Israelis go out to celebrate their independence, Palestinians often come out and wave Palestinian flags and observe the foundation of the state of Israel as a Jewish state 
as a tragedy, as even a catastrophe, just as Frederick Douglass did July 4th. Frederick Douglass said, I can never see July 4th and the foundation of the United States as anything but a crime until slavery is permanently banned. And so the Nakba law arises from Israel's peculiar institution of apartheid, introduced by Alex Miller, a 28-year-old resident, or a 28-year-old immigrant from Moscow. Um, someone like Zev Elkin, who doesn't seem to be particularly interested in the indigenous people and connect in any real connection to the land, who arrived not, possibly not even knowing that Palestinians were there, but who recognized and told me in an interview with me, who recognized the great political potential for mobilizing resentment against Palestinians. Because the Nakba, even though there were these millions of refugees were excluded and were busy lining up in food queues for almost a kilometer long in destroyed camps like Yarmouk and Damascus. Even though they were excluded, their ghosts hovered over Israeli society and the Nakba still threatened Israel. As Limor Livnat, the Minister of Sports and Culture, declared, um, the teaching of the Nakba promotes disloyalty. And so Miller introduced this bill and it passed once again in diluted form, allowing financial penalties on anyone who is a con connected to an NGO for participating in Nakba observances. The NGO, the human rights group, um, can be financially penalized. Another chilling of speech in Israel. Now, why was this law introduced? Why? What's so troubling about Palestinians waving flags? What's so troubling about Palestinian nationalism? Why did Haifa University two months ago ban the waving of the Palestinian flag on its campus? Why are Palestinian flags often illegal to wave in, East Jerusalem, in, in, in parts of Jerusalem? Why, during Operation Cast Lead, were people arrested by the scores for waving Palestinian flags in Israeli streets? Why do Palestinian symbols and bearing Palestinian symbols make you unsafe in Israel? It's because the right wing, which is dominant and incipient in Israel, understands something that many of us understand, which is that the Nakba continues that the Nakba never ended in 1948, that every day for Palestinians is 1948. Now, I approach that in my book, I approach the Nakba and its persistence and continuation as a crime that has to be reversed. The right wing understands it as a project that needs to be finished, because if in, until it's finished, and either the Glick plan or the J Street plan is fully realized and consolidated, Israel will be in permanent conflict. And once it's finished, then they can start naming their mascots after Arabs and their military hardware after Arabs, just as we name ours after Indians. Then Arabs will be a source of fun and games. But in, as long as they keep resisting with their mischievous BDS and their popular protests and their dangerous stone throwing, Israel remains in crisis. As Avigdor Lieberman said, Referring to the earliest days of Zionist settlement, nothing has changed since the days of the tower and the stockade. And so it's because of this hatred of the presence of what is known as a demographic threat, and the fact that it won't go away, the fact that Israel has no end game of its own, that it can only simply manage the conflict, as Lieberman recently said at the Saban Center in Washington, as Israel's defense minister, Moshe Yaalon, said, we have to do away with pie-in-the-sky solutions. It's because of that that they are resorting to ethnic cleansing and anti-democratic laws to finish 48. We see the mantra of finish 48 in the graffiti left at the site of Der Yassin. We see it in the firebombed fish restaurant across the street from me where I stayed in Jaffa, five minutes south of Tel Aviv and in the vandalized Muslim headstones in Jaffa, directly adjacent to the Perez Center for Peace, five minutes south of Tel Aviv. We hear the mantra, finish 48, in the words of Deputy Transportation Minister Sipi Hotoveli, the Sarah Palin of Israel, who speaks better English than Sarah Palin, <laughs> 34 years old, intelligenic, 
a rising star who told Hanin Zawabi, who promised to her on national TV that she would ban her and all Arabs from the Knesset, who declared, I am a Jewish racist. I favor a Jewish state with a Jewish majority. And we hear it in the words of Shimon Gapso, the mayor of Nazareth Elite, Upper Nazareth, who has waged a literal war on Christmas which Bill O'Reilly has never discussed. A literal war on Christmas banning Christmas trees and the display of any non-Jewish symbol. Gapso, who is from Lieberman's party, has declared that he will not allow the display, he will fight the display of any Jewish symbol in his city. And he has invoked the words of Ben-Gurion and the founding fathers of Israel and said they also sought an ethnically pure state. So if you're going to call me a racist, call everyone a racist here. We hear that increasingly from the right wing. We heard that from Reuben Rivlin, who was in the last Knesset, the speaker of the Knesset, whose family are eighth generation Sabras from the Likud party. And he said, how dare you, liberal Zionists, try to boycott our settlements? You were the ones who ethnically cleansed Lida. You were the ones who ethnically cleansed Jaffa in 48. Your hands aren't clean. We're not moving anyone out of their homes. We're just building new homes. And so Rivlin is simply saying, how dare you stop us from finishing the job that you started? And he's right. It was a job started by the Zionist left that will be finished by the Zionist right unless someone gets in their way. We hear the call to finish 48 in Naftali Bennett's plan to annex the West Bank and do away with the idea of Palestine once and for all. We hear the call to finish 48 in the tracts issued by state-funded Israeli rabbis, key religious authorities, signing letters by the hundreds, a letter declaring that it is illegal, falsely declaring that it is illegal under Jewish law to rent apartments to non-Jews, and a dual letter issued by their wives declaring that it is illegal under Jewish law for, Jewish, for Jews to have relationships with non-Jews, specifically Jewish women and Arabs. We hear for, finish 48 in the decision by the National Civil Service Administration of Israel inspired by this letter and inspired by the anti-miscegenation movement which it gave rise to banning religious Jewish women from volunteering in Israeli hospitals after 9 p.m. for fear that they will date Arab doctors. A peculiar decision if you're an American Jew and you've been raised to believe that and your parents dream of you marrying a doctor. <laughs> the call to finish 48 rings out from the anti-miscegenation movement in Israel, from the group Lehava, which has been called to testify about the dangers of assimilation in the Israeli Knesset by Tzipi Hotoveli, by their hotline that they operate, allowing callers to inform on inter-religious and inter-ethnic couples, by the civil patrols they operate on Israel's beaches, warning Jewish women of the dangerous wiles of Arab men, by the posters appear appearing around Jerusalem featuring the faces of Arab men deemed to have made passes at Jewish women, and by the leaflets handed out around Jerusalem warning Palestinian men of the dangers they face if they dare approach Jewish women. We heard finish 48 in the chants of the Jewish youth who chanted, a Jew is a soul, an Arab is a son of a bitch, which is also a chant that rings out from the stands in Jerusalem at Teddy Kollek Stadium when Beitar Jerusalem scores a goal. And they were chanting this as they beat 19-year-old Jamal Julani into a coma in Zion Square while dozens and dozens of bystanders stood by and watched without doing anything. These were teenagers who had been told by a 15-year-old female friend of hers that Julani had made a pass at her. And so they treated him as other ethnic nationalists in another era, in another place, treated Emmett Till. And at the courtroom, the key perpetrator declared that his only regret was that Julani wasn't dead. 
They're all united in a single cause to finish 48. To produce an ethnically pure state free of demographic contaminants. Am Yisrael Chai. The children chanted at Al Arakib. The high schoolers chanted from the hills of Al Arakib, a Bedouin village which was demolished by Jewish, uh, by Jewish National Fund emblazoned bulldozers in 2010. Those high school volunteers had been brought from the town of Kiryat Gat to carry out the belongings and the furniture of Bedouins who lived in this village since before the State of Israel was founded. And they, they vandalized the homes, then watched the bulldozers move in to wipe the village from the frame of the, from off the face of the map, chanting, the people of Israel live. This village was destroyed as part of the Prover Plan, a plan introduced in the Knesset to expel 40 to 70,000 indigenous Bedouins who are citizens of the State of Israel, but don't have the benefit of Jewishness. They are being, according in the words of the Israeli government, Judaized, replaced by small Jewish communities that will discriminate openly on, on the basis of the acceptance to communities law. al Arakib has been destroyed 65 times since that first demolition. And if you want to watch it being demolished, watch my video. I witnessed its third demolition. I witnessed Activists from anarchists against the wall tossed away by riot squads like empty crates. I watched bulldozers trundle around the village, crushing structures, and I watched young girls sitting on their beds in the open desert crying as their homes were destroyed. Finish 48 is the plan. And after 1948, a law was introduced. These laws that I described to you are not the first anti-democratic and racist laws introduced. They're simply building on a pre-existing skeleton. Among the first laws was the Prevention of Infiltration Act passed in 1953. Palestinians were uprooted from their homes by the hundreds of thousands, but there were no walls at the time. There weren't really, there were some barbed wire fences, but they could still walk back in. And so they tried to reunite with their families. And they tried to farm the land that had fallen fallow. And the Israeli government, through the Knesset, through a democratic vote by the voice of the Jewish Israeli public in the Knesset, declared that their presence was illegal, that they were infiltrators, and that they could be then removed by the border police. This law has been amended to apply to a new demographic threat, a new threat to the ethnic purity of the state of Israel, the 60,000 African asylum seekers who have fled Janjaweed in Sudan, fled from Darfur, and received no aid or comfort and no support from the Free Darfur Movement founded by pro-Israel forces in this country to whitewash their support for apartheid. And they've fled from Eritrea, from harsh repression in Eritrea. And they have been the victims, they've been in Israel, deprived of work permits, um, declared a threat, concentrated in South Tel Aviv, and they become the victims of race riots. On May 23, 2012, Miri Regev, the, interi the um, Interior Committee Chief in the Knesset, former spokesperson for the Israeli army, appeared at a rally before a thousand local residents in South Tel Aviv and declared that the Africans are a cancer in Israel's body. According to an Israeli Democracy Institute poll, 52% of Jewish Israelis agreed with that opinion, and a plurality agreed with violence against Africans, which was just what was about to happen. Regev later issued an apology, by the way, to cancer survivors. Meanwhile, hundreds of thugs and vandals rioted through African areas, smashing their windows, attacking any African they could find, chasing Africans to the street, stopped from bloodshed um, by the last minute presence of riot police. I titled my chapter about that episode, which was almost unreported in US mainstream media, The Night of Broken Glass. And I've encountered harsh, harsh antagonism and anger for that title. And I stand by that title because I stand by the universal lessons of the Holocaust, which declare never again to anyone
Eli Yishai, who was then the head of the ultra-nationalist Shas party, uh, de declared that he would make the lives of Africans miserable. He promised to make their lives miserable, and he said that these are often Muslims who don't recognize that this country belongs to the white man. Those are his, that was his language. Those are his exact words. He said that despite the fact that his family comes from Tunisia. <laughs> but racial, the, the, the way race is constructed in Israel is completely different than it is here. Because as a member of the, um, the Jewish majority, to the extent that it is a majority anymore, he saw himself as the white man. And so Benjamin Netanyahu set about to do what Yishai recommended. The law was amended, the 1953 law applying to Palestinians, allowing for any non-Jewish African to be arrested on site and indefinitely detained without charges for the crime of not being Jewish. They were unable to gain any asylum status in Israel. Uh, I think there was one year, 2013, when the only African who got asylum status happened to be albino. And this is despite Israel's signature of the 1951 Re con um, convention on UN Convention on Refugee Rights. And so they have been rounded up. The roundups are beginning. They get letters in the mail. After, there was a, recently a strike of anti-Africans recognizing the reality that they, of, of uh, non-Jewish Africans recognizing the reality that they faced. And so they came out in the streets by the thousands declaring, we're people too, where are refugee rights? Just give us protection because if we go back to Sudan and we go back to Eritrea, we'll be jailed and many of us will be killed. Behind closed doors, Israel's been sending them back to the, Uda to the Sudan. Israel recently cut a deal with Paul Kagame of Rwanda to send thousands of non-Jewish Africans to Rwanda in exchange for what? Most likely, cut rate deals on weapons. It cut the same deal with Uganda. And so they recognized the reality they were in. Muntasim Ali, who is one of the leaders of these protests, who is a refugee rights advocate, who's one of the first non-Jews in history to run for Tel Aviv City Council, who speaks far better Hebrew than Abe Foxman or Alan Dershowitz, recently got a letter in the mail. And it said, you are to report to the Holot Open Accommodation Center as soon as possible. That means that he is to report to an internment camp in the desert for Africans, which is very similar to the internment camp that was built in this country for Japanese Americans during World War II who are deemed to possess enemy race blood. Currently, there are 500 Africans in Holot. They are allowed to leave, technically. It is an open accommodation center, but they must report for roll call three times a day. And if they leave, they're in the middle of the desert, so there's nowhere to go. The only rule is they must be back by sundown. They have to be there to sleep inside the center at night because they must be segregated from the Israeli public for fear that they will assimilate. Assimilation is the danger. Their reproduction is the danger. The f they may have relationships with Israelis. I have a few friends in Israel who have be gotten into relationships with African refugees who have fallen in love but can't get married and can't really feel secure in their relationship because their lover may soon be rounded up and interned and deported and killed. And so this reminds me, this policy of a book by James Lowen, who is an American historian, um, who wrote a book about the sundown towns that dotted the landscape of the United States which passed ordinances during the 1920s and 30s illegalizing the presence of African Americans after dark. Now with this, this is anachronistic. It's unusual. It's something that is, in, as Americans, we would reject because we believe in equality before the law. It's why we're campaigning in New York against stop and frisk. It's why Arizonans have campaigned against SB 1070. It's why there's still activism against these racist policies. But in Israel, there is a total consensus led by Benjamin Netanyahu and the movement to finish 48 in favor of making Israel the largest sundown town in the world. As William Faulkner said about the American South, 
The past isn't even dead. The past is never past. It isn't even dead. My friend Allison Dagger visited Holot. She's a writer for Mondo Ice, which is one of the key websites, news sites you should be following um, on this issue, along with Electronic Intifada and RichardSilverstein.com. Richard's in the back here. And she's one of the few journalists to get into Holot, and I asked her to describe it to me. Um, and just in, as we move towards the close of this talk, towards q and I'll read you what she wrote about what she saw inside this camp. Breakfast daily for the people interned in this camp is one piece of white bread. That's it. The water is not clean and comes from a dirty faucet. They are given cups sometimes. There is not enough soap and sporadically they are only allowed to shower once a week. For their labor they receive around six dollars per day as they are allowed the only labor they are allowed to perform is as the prison's janitors. Everyone is lanky and moves slow, head sunken. One man I interviewed only leaves his bed 20 minutes a day. The rest of the time, he sleeps. People are broken, depressed, and quite frighteningly wasting into waifs. Are they being starved to death? No one has died, and the first and only independent medical review came by Physicians for Human Rights nearly two months ago. But it is undeniable that people are thin and sickly and that something grotesque is happening behind those walls and three metal turnstops that comprise the front checkpoint. I see no rules being followed in this facility other than that one cannot leave or they will be rounded up and returned within 48 hours. I cannot underscore how much of a horrific scene it is. Holot is not considered by Israel prison. It's called an open facility. You call it a sundown town. After visiting it, seeing people locked up and thinning, I can only describe it as a concentration camp, and I'm usually very reserved with this kind of language. I've printed that descriptor, but I don't know how else to describe it. She is not the only one to have described this as a concentration camp. The Israeli architectural collective Bikrom has done so, and Reuven Rivlin, who I mentioned before, the former speaker of the Knesset, described it as a concentration camp. Then there is Arnon Solfer, who is an Israeli government advisor, whose last name means counter in Hebrew. And so his colleagues call him Arnon the Arab counter, because he has advised successive governments on how to manage the demographic threats Israel face. He's the premier demographer. He is the man who convinced Ariel Sharon to build the separation wall in the West Bank, which Benjamin Netanyahu has defended because it can prevent demographic spillover. He is the man who convinced Sharon to conduct the Gaza withdrawal for demographic reasons, to help supplement the Jewish majority, and then to place the Gaza Strip under siege. And he has issued recommendations on controlling the growth of the African population. And what he recommended in an official government document, which my colleague, the Israeli journalist David Sheen, retrieved, is rikuz. Those of you who know Hebrew will know this word means concentration. And it is the very language, Rikuz, featured on the website in Hebrew of the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Foundation, referring to the conditions that Jews lived in in World War II Europe. Now, of course, no one's calling these camps extermination camps. Israel has no plans to exterminate Africans or to do anything like that. These camps are similar to the camps that Native Americans were interned in in the United States. Filipinos under U.S. occupation were in. Boer, Zulus under Boer domination in Africa and Japanese Americans. But they suggest that Zionism is going to a very, very dark and disturbing place, that it has reached a terminal phase. There's someone in my book who I wanted to introduce to Americans who has given me a lot of insight and inspiration. He's no longer alive, and he identified throughout his life as a Zionist. His name is Yeshaya Hulebovich. He possessed three PhDs, taught biochemistry at Hebrew University, um, was said to, authored the Encyclopedia Judaica, and was said to be the only man who knew more about Maimonides than Maimonides. He was be a beloved figure in Israel. Israelis would call him at his home late at night asking for religious advice, marriage advice. How do we quit smoking, dear professor? And he would answer every call just as Noam Chomsky answers every email, and just as I respond to so many annoying Facebook messages. 
not to compare myself to those two in any other way. Um, Leibovitch, in 1967, when Israel took the occupied territories, when it conquered the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, Golan Heights, Sinai, and Israelis erupted in ecstatic celebrations, stood against the tide of messianism. He stood against the generals. He stood against the army. He stood against the leadership. And he declared that the occupation would transform Israel into a secret police state in 1968. He warned that the Jews would be the administrators and the secret police, the colonial dominators. They would administer a system that would resemble Rhodesia under a Jewish authority. Those were his words. And he said that the, they would be forced to rely on Arab quislings to control the Arab population, foreshadowing the rise of the Palestinian Authority. Two years later, he issued his darkest prophecy. And what he wrote was pure prophecy. That it, Zionism and Israel, if it maintained this system, this peculiar institution resembling the kind that Rhodesia and South Africa had embraced, would begin to enact concentration camps. And Israel would no longer be worth defending and would no longer deserve to exist. Those were his words. Lieberman's prophecies came true before the eyes of Israelis, young Israelis in the 1980s lined up outside his office, banging on his door, beseeching him for his, his advice. What should we do? I'm 17 and next year they're going to send me to the occupied territories to dominate and control people. I don't want to do it. They're going to send me to Beirut, to a bloodbath. That's our Vietnam. They're going to send me to South Lebanon to occupy more people. What do we do? And he told them to organize mass insubordination. Mass insubordination and mass refusal. Refuse to serve in the army and shake this state to its core, this state whose only meaning is the domination of another people. Those were his words. In 1991, Leibovitch, for his service to Israeli society, was nominated with the Israel Prize the highest honor in Israel. But he began sharpening his criticisms, telling young Israelis, don't follow orders. If you just follow orders, you're no different than Eichmann, and you will be a Judeo-Nazi. He said, we are witnessing a Judeo-Nazi mentality in this country of people who don't question orders to, to commit crimes against humanity. He even called the man who presided over Eichmann's prosecution, Meyer Landau, a Judeo-Nazi. Because Landau, as a Supreme Court Justice, issued the opinion authorizing the Shin Bet to torture Palestinian prisoners, putting an authorization for torture in writing. Yitzhak Rabin, who was then the defense minister, demanded that the Israel Prize be withdrawn for Leibovitch. And Leibovitch capitulated. He said, I don't want to cause any more problems. He rescinded the award. A year later, he was dead, and he has since been largely forgotten. We know nothing about him. But his words echo in this room, in the words of so many Jews and Israelis and Palestinians uh, and people around the world who have, been, who have resisted Zionism um, and who've paid the price, who've made the sacrifice. And so it's a call for us to continue the work we're doing or reconsider our embrace of Zionism and to begin to organize mass insubordination or pay the price of watching the project to finish 48 completed. Thank you.